From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host David Feldman. Welcome back, David, from your technical difficulties. Well, speaking of technical difficulties, I've already voted early for Elizabeth Warren for 2020. Got that out of the way. That, that's maybe, maybe <laughs> that's a little, little too early. Too early. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. He's so complicated, David. And I know it's a little above you. And we also have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello. We're going to talk about living wages and why the Democrats aren't pushing it in a emblazoned way all over the country before the election. That's right. And we're going to talk about that in the context of the midterm elections coming up. And we're going to come at it from two different angles on today's show. First, we welcome back Congressman and Constitutional Scholar Jamie Raskin, who is running for a re-election in Maryland's 8th District. And we hope he will give us sort of an inside the Thunderdome view of what could happen if the Democrats take back the House and what to expect if they don't. Then our second guest is one of the foremost experts on election law in the United States. His name is Richard Winger, and he is the editor of Ballot Access News, which is a monthly newsletter that watchdogs not only individual voting rights, but also the rights of third parties to get on ballots. And as Ralph knows, with the two major parties controlling the process, it's not so easy. In some cases, almost impossible. In between, we will check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber, who will clue us into the white-collar carnage that usually takes place in tall buildings with air-conditioned suites. <laughs> and if we have time, we'll motor through some of your listener questions. But regular listeners know that Ralph is always preaching that the fulcrum of power in our system is the Congress, the smallest, most accessible branch of our government. So let's talk to a congressman. David? Congressman Jamie Raskin represents Maryland's 8th Congressional District in the House of Representatives. He is the vice ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee and serves on two judiciary subcommittees, the Subcommittee on the Constitution and Civil Justice and the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security and Investigation. For more than 25 years, Congressman Raskin has been a professor of constitutional law at American University's Washington College of Law, and he's written several books, including the Washington Post bestseller, Overruling Democracy, The Supreme Court Versus the American People, and the highly acclaimed We the Students, Supreme Court Cases for and About America's Students. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Congressman Jamie Raskin. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, Jamie, as you know, the polls are tightening on the congressional races. We have a sense out here of deja vu all over again. 2016, it was supposed to be a big blue wave, and now the pollsters are telling us it might be more of a blue trickle. And I have predicted that this would happen if the Democrats don't come out with the major issues on the minds of the American people. And one of them for tens of millions of Americans is low wages, frozen federal minimum wage at seven and a quarter, not to mention all the other terrible suppressing votes, uh, suppressing voter turnout by the Republicans, suppressing environmental controls to reduce the risk of cancer and other diseases, suppressing the corruption in the Trump administration, not investigating it from the Congress, bloating the military budget, and starving our public infrastructure, and on and on. So I was delighted to see that even though the Democratic National Committee and other Democratic organizations are not emblazoning this horrific series of House and Senate Republican votes in the last two years, that you put it out. And people, you can go to jamieraskin.com. That's J-A-M-I-E-R-A-S-K-I-N.com. And you will see a selection of horrific, outrageous things that the GOP House majority did in the last term of the congressional session. And I'm looking it over now. And you know what I find, Jamie, is a lot of these are what I call indiscriminate injustice to all the people in the country, never mind Republican, Democrat, the toxic environment, cutting social safety nets affect voters who call themselves conservatives or liberals or whatever. So I want to ask you, 
Give us an idea of what these votes are. Well, Ralph, thank you so much for having me. And we're living in a time where there's such a smokescreen of propaganda that falls over everything that people are forgetting about what's really taking place. And so, you know, I think we've done a, a pretty good job of reminding people about their efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act and to destroy pre-existing condition coverage for insurance. And there's some talk about their attempt to gut the Dodd-Frank legislation, which put some modest limits on the ability of Wall Street to plunge us into another financial crisis like the one in 2008. But there's a whole host of other votes that go right to our ability to govern ourselves and to have a decent society, which are just forgotten. Like, take number eight on my list, where they voted basically to strip one of the key protections from the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is that if you work overtime more than 40 hours, you get paid time and a half. Well, the Republicans wanted to trade that for comp time instead of money. So it would be up to the employer to decide they could pay you back in comp time. And they could also tell you when you could take it or not. Now, that's something that, you know, we were able to block, but that's like reflective of what has generally been taking place. They want to try to override the laws of 50 states to say that if you are a victim of medical malpractice, you're limited to $250,000 in terms of pain and suffering and punitive damages and other kinds of damages. So, you know, there's also these repeated assaults on federalism that are taking place just because they understand that they've got the opportunity for these power grabs at the federal level. So, yeah, I just wanted to remind people about all of these things, the attack on class action lawsuits, the attempt to destroy the conceal carry weapons laws of the 50 states to say that if you can get the right to carry a loaded concealed weapon in the most permissive state in the union, which is Florida, where 1.3 million people have that right, then you can take your gun anywhere in the country, regardless of what the laws of the other states are. So there's just been this outrageous special interest agenda that they've tried to shove down everybody's throats. And I don't want anybody to forget about it. You know, the cruelty and viciousness of what they actually vote for and send to the Senate is obscured by their phony rhetoric of Speaker Paul Ryan and and others. I was really amazed that even with children, they're cruel. Talk about the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and other social safeguards for the poor mother's children. Yes. Well, of course, now the rhetoric when it comes to any form of corporate regulation that would benefit the public, like Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act, is to deregulate. And a number of the points on my list are when they have tried to gut the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. But when it comes to regulation relating to programs that would actually help people, like the SNAP programs, which is nutritional supplemental assistance for people. They are bureaucratic extremists of the Kafkaesque and Orwellian variety. I mean, they want to put people through all kinds of repeated tests and examinations and so on. So they just drive people out of the program. And it was estimated that the new rules that they wanted to propound to put into the SNAP program would reduce by two million the number of people who get to access its benefits. And, you know, we know that we've got millions of hungry people in the country, but it's too much for them to think that people would easily be able to go and get the food that they need to supply their families. Even worse than that, they voted to weaken the Clean Air Act, which I worked hard for in the early 70s to pass, and allow these companies to poison the air, water, soil, food with uncontrolled toxic emissions that, and in your 16th point of the GOP votes, quote, cause neurological ailments, lung disease, asthma, and heart disease among both children and seniors, end quote. Fortunately, a lot of these are being blocked in the Senate by the Democrats. It's not that the Republicans don't want to pass what their House brethren have passed. It just shows what they're delivering for big business in this country. It's always the corporation first over workers, consumers, small taxpayers, you name it. I was amazed the other day in the New York Times, they had an article by the former chairman of Goldman Sachs and later Secretary of the Treasury, 
Henry Paulson, and it was co-authored by Ben Bernanke, who is former chairman of the Federal Reserve, and by Timothy Geithner, who comes from Wall Street and the Federal Reserve world, and he was Treasury Secretary. And you know what they said? They said, Congress is taking away the tools we need in the next Wall Street crash. And that they were too kind to their Republican buddies, but it's the Republicans who are weakening the Dodd-Frank law and setting up another speculative binge with other people's pension money and mutual money by the Wall Street bosses, crashing the economy again and demanding a taxpayer bailout. So this is what the Republicans are doing in reality in contract to their rhetoric and the rhetoric of Donald Trump. Yes, you know, they've got this missionary zeal for deregulation of Wall Street, deregulation of the financial industry. Then they want to strip the ability of consumers, of patients, of citizens to sue by destroying the class action mechanism and by making it much harder for people to get into court and then taking away their possible relief once they're in court. And then they're not doing anything to prevent the repeat of a bailout of the biggest companies in the country. The the irony, Ralph, I see is that all over America now, the Republicans are campaigning against Democrats as socialists. And the only socialists I can see out there are the big banks and the Republicans who are behind them who want to have the government ready to bail them out whenever they crash the economy. Yeah. In reality, they say, don't worry, folks. Don't worry, rich people. Socialism in Washington will always bail us out, bail out corporate capitalism. You know, Kevin Phillips, who is a Republican, he's written a lot of books, a very astute political analyst, some years ago said that the Republicans go for the jugular and the Democrats go for the capillaries. And, you know, I can't help but see that this is happening again. In the debate between Senator Ted Cruz, who should be defeated in Texas for his record, never mind his foul mouth, Beto O'Rourke, who's making a run of it, was confronted in a debate when Cruz twice said that the Republican Party stands for lower taxes, less regulation, and a strong military. Well, lower taxes for the rich, less regulation of big corporations, you know, have a choice. Either the government regulates the out-of-control drug industry with its skyrocketing drug prices, or the drug crisis, the drug companies will regulate the patients in this country and tell them pay or die for their drug prices. Many of these drugs developed by taxpayer money from the National Institutes of Health and given free to selected drug companies. So talk about what I think is the last clear chance of the Democratic Party to win in November. And that is tens of millions of Americans who are making less in inflation-adjusted wages than they made, the workers made in 1968. And the federal minimum wage is $7 and a quarter. And Democrats are on the record as wanting a higher minimum wage. They often don't specify it. It's in their resolutions as a party. But when you look at the massive TV ads and debates, Jamie Raskin, you don't see this up there with the pre-existing condition situation that the Democrats are publicizing the Republicans want to take away. Insurance for pre-existing condition. What can the Democrats do in the next week and few days to make this a major issue and to get more lower income people to vote, including Hispanics and African Americans, who the press is saying, many of whom are feeling disempowered and don't see any reason to vote? What can the Democrats do in terms of publicity, debates, advertisement to make a living wage more of the issue separating them from the Republicans, many of whom don't even believe in a minimum wage and want to keep the seven and a quarter frozen at the federal level. Well, that's right. Well, look, we're the party of the people or we're nothing. We've got to be the party of the people. And, you know, real wages have been eroded steadily over the decades. The minimum wage has been eroded basically to meaninglessness at this point. And, you know, 70, 75 percent of American people support a dramatic increase in the minimum wage. And the $15 measures are winning all over the country where, you know, they're put on the ballot. And so 
you know, how many people could support their family earning seven fifty or eight bucks an hour? I mean, just it doesn't work. So this absolutely should be one of the things that we're pressing here. The Republicans have succeeded in demolishing labor unions in the private sector. It's way below 10 percent. The Janice Supreme Court decision engineered by the right wing coup they've instituted in the courts will further reduce unionism on the public sector side. And so in order to stand for the working people in America, we have got to advance universal laws and programs that benefit everybody. And the minimum wage is one of those. And we should be proud of it and we should be out there fighting for it. And it's something that's extremely popular with young people. And it's extremely popular in precisely the areas where we got hard hit in the 2016 election in you know, Indiana and Michigan and Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and so on. Well, you know, I've just written a column, listeners, you can get it on Nader.org. And the title is Congressman Jamie Raskin. And the subtitle is Vote for a Raise, Expose the Republican Records, and Win the Elections. The AFL-CIO once put out a book in 1996 called America Needs a Raise. They could have put it out today. Wages have been frozen and stagnant all over the country. Tens of millions of people can't put food on the table with that low wages before deductions, no less. They can't afford health insurance. And the question is, in the remaining days until the November election, what can the National Democratic Party do to make this an emblazoned issue? Because in the minds of most people, they're not getting that kind of front burner message that the Democrats stand for restoring the minimum wage gutted by inflation and raising it to $15 an hour for starters. Yes. So, but Ralph, I've got to close on this thought because I've got to go make a speech right now. But let me say, I'm totally with you on this. What we need to do is to put our agenda forward in terms of defending Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid against their clear effort to pay for their atrocious tax legislation, which was a trillion and a half dollar giveaway to special interests, by cutting people's benefits. And these are programs people have paid into. We've got to advance the minimum wage and fight for that in order to give America a raise. And we've got to remind everybody that they're not anti-regulation. They would love to regulate the poor in such a way that they have no access to their nutritional benefits. They would love to regulate women's health care so women and their families would not have access to Planned Parenthood, would not have access to the full panoply of health services that women ought to be getting in insurance. They want to allow insurance companies and employers to pull the plug on complete health care for women. So we got to be out fighting on this. If we're not doing that, what happens is, is that we can get carried away with whatever Donald Trump is tweeting about that day. The caravan is clearly what Donald Trump wants to ride to victory on November 6th. And we've got to put the issues of the American people front and center over the next 13 days. Yeah. And, you know, over the decades, uh, our support of dictatorships in Central America are flipping leaders that are elected and replacing them with dictatorial regimes that repress their people and allow a dozen or so families to control the economy in the plutocracy. No wonder poor people are driving out and trying to get a better life by crossing our border. And of course, Donald Trump supports these dictatorships in Central America. And now he's making the caravan an issue. I mean, how gullible does he think the American people are? Don't ask that question, Jamie. <laughs> so, yeah, well, listeners, and- listeners should get Jamie Raskin's roundup of 20 outrageous things the GOP House majority did in the last term. They just have to go to Jamie Raskin, J-A-M-I-E-R-A-S-K-I-N dot com and reprint it, send it around. And it's very well footnoted, by the way, as bespeaks his constitutional law background. You know what? I'm glad you did, Jamie, that on the 20th question, you nailed the Republicans' not on their votes, but on what they refused to do. And I'm going to read it. Quote, the GOP, which is the Republicans, the GOP did nothing to address the nation's infrastructure needs, pass the DREAM Act, reduce gun violence, address climate change, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, increase the minimum wage, 
address the soaring price of prescription drugs, lower the cost of health care, strengthen voting rights, and curb the power of foreign and corporate wealth in our elections, or challenge the outrageous corruption of this Trump administration, end quote. So it's not just what they did, it's what they allow to continue that's ravaging the American people, their families, their children, their air, water, soil, their schools, their public services, and not doing anything, I might add, about the bloated military budget, which is totally out of control and unauditable. You know, the Pentagon, Jamie, will not give you auditable data, so the Government Accountability Office, the accountants of the Congress, can audit it. It's in violation of a 1992 federal law. Constant, every year, Pentagon violates the 1992 federal law requiring an audible budget. So that's why I think listeners out there, just spread the word and tell your senators and representatives why they're not making a bigger issue out of this abysmal GOP voting record. And the Democrats, I keep saying, Jim, you should be landsliding the Republicans over the recent decade. Instead, the reverse is happening. What do you think the National Democratic Party should do in the next few days before the election? Well, I got to leave you with this thought. I think we need to get out there and talk about how right wing and extremist is this agenda. They told us very clearly what they would do if they could get it through the Senate. And clearly Trump would sign all this stuff. It would take us to just a very different form of government and a very different kind of society. And we need to stand strong for the working people of the country with an increase in minimum wage, with the real investment in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And we've got to deal with the overarching crisis of climate change, which they ignore and deny in every way. Thank you for having me, Ralph. Thank you, Jamie Raskin. Again, go to jamieraskin.com and see what one Democrat is trying to do to turn this election around for the people instead of for the giant corporations and the hooks they have in the Republican Party. We've been speaking to Congressman Jamie Raskin. We will link to his website and that particular article at ralphnaderradiohour.com. When we come back, we're going to talk to one of the foremost experts on election law, Richard Winger of Ballot Access News. But first, we're going to check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. You are listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Take it away, Russell. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Report on Morning Minute for Friday, October 26, 2018. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Canadian criminologist Frank Pierce was the first scholar to use the term crimes of the powerful. His groundbreaking 1976 book of the same name provided insightful critiques of liberal orthodox criminology. Historically, crimes of the powerful were largely neglected by criminologists, but there's an important and growing body of work addressing this gap. Now comes a group of scholars who have put together a new book, Revisiting Crimes of the Powerful. It's a collection of 24 essays by criminologists from around the world. The book is edited by Steve Biddle, Lorreen Snyder, Steve Toombs, and David White. Biddle is an associate professor of criminology at the University of Ottawa. There are many great scholars out there doing important work on crimes of the powerful, but generally speaking, it's a topic that is marginalized, Biddle said. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host David Feldman and Ralph. Now in our election coverage, let's turn our attention to ballot access. David? Richard Lee Winger is an advocate for more equitable laws allowing access to the ballot for minor parties. Winger has testified on behalf of these issues in court cases around the country and has been published in journals ranging from the Journal of Election Law to the Fordham Urban Law Review. In 1985, he began publishing Ballot Access News, a monthly newsletter covering developments in ballot access law and the third parties in general. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Richard Winger. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Yes, welcome. For once, David didn't do full justice to one of our guests. You're one of the great full-time citizens in our country. You basically are committed from your kitchen table in your apartment and putting out the singular newsletter talking about state after state laws that obstruct access to the ballot to give voters more voices and choices beyond the two-party duopoly, and what is being done to fight back the lawsuits that 
citizens are winning the sometimes legislation to open the door to the ballot for more people in various states. And you put this out every month, and there's nothing like it in the country, listeners. It's called Ballot Access News. The website is www.ballot-access.org. comes out every month. I recommend it heartily to those of you who are concerned about a narrowing of the electoral system to two parties often dialing for the same commercial dollars. Give us an idea, Richard, of the scene. I know you have pointed out that no other Western country obstructs candidates from getting on the ballot, requires so many signatures on petitions, picking at them for trivial reasons in order to invalidate them. You know, we went through that with the Green Party presidential run. But in recent issues of your newsletter, you seem to be a little optimistic. So tell us what the grim reality is and what changes you see on the horizon in state after state, which under our Constitution gives the states the right to establish the electoral rules. Well, Ralph is absolutely right. Other Western democracies, it simply never even occurred to people that they should start blocking serious candidates who want to run from running. It's just it's just hard to understand what went wrong with the United States, but we've had this bad habit for a long time. Even a hundred years ago, for some reason in this country, state officials started thinking it was okay to write ballot access laws. They're so discriminatory and so peculiar and so restrictive that serious people couldn't run for office. Even Theodore Roosevelt in 1912 couldn't get in the ballot in Oklahoma. Eugene Debs, the year he he ran in 1920, he couldn't get on the ballot in five states. So unfortunately, when bad habits are set up a long time ago, it's tough to get rid of them. But Ralph is also right. Things are generally getting better. In fact, if you're running outside the major parties for president right now, the laws are easier than they've been as a percentage since 1932. Can you describe, Richard, some of the many obstructions other than huge number of signatures required in places like North Carolina or California? Well, there's a really peculiar situation in Florida. As you know, the Federal Election Commission was set up in the 1970s, and it deals strictly with campaign finance. The FEC has no expertise and no interest in figuring out which parties have a modicum of support. But for some reason, the Florida legislature in 2011 passed a bill that said, well, if a party is on the ballot in Florida, we're still not going to put their presidential nominee on the ballot unless the party is recognized by the FEC as a national committee. And they were embarrassed in 2011 when Americans elect a big party backed by a billionaire said, well, hey, Florida, this isn't fair. We can't get FEC recognition as a national committee. For one thing, the FEC won't give it to new parties. And so Florida said, oh, oh, that's OK. We're not going to enforce this law. They were so embarrassed by their own law. The secretary of state said, don't worry, I'm not going to enforce it. Fine. But then at the very end of August 2016, the Florida Secretary of State changed his mind, and he kicked Evan McMullen off the ballot, and he said, oh, your party isn't recognized by the FEC, so you can't be on the ballot. And furthermore, he did it just before they were printing the ballots, and there was no time for Evan McMullen to sue. And if people don't remember who Evan McMullen was, he was a very strong third-party candidate in 2016. He represented Republicans who don't like Donald Trump. And he he did well in the 11 states he was on the ballot. He got 2.2% of the vote. That's very significant. If he had been in the ballot in the whole country, well, things might have been different. So well, I you just, point, Richard, you point to the arbitrary nature of state secretary of states. I mean, I was supposed to be on the Oregon ballot in a prior presidential run, and then the secretary of state just changed his mind, just, just said, no, you're not going to be on the ballot. Sue me. Well, you sue. You know how long court cases take. I mean, the election comes and goes. 
And You're the whole absolutely thing is, is right. Moved. What happened to you in Oregon was outrageous. The county said you had enough valid signatures. It's the counties that check signatures, not the state. So after the county told the Secretary of State you have enough valid signatures, he just ignored it. And he thought, made up reasons why he wasn't going to count some of your signatures, like the pages weren't numbered in the right order. Oh, that's right. Oh, I, that makes me mad more. to think in, about in Ohio, it. <laughs> in Ohio, where you're required, I think, 15,000 verified signatures. No, only 5,000. You turned uh, in 15,000. Right. And then they struck 5,000 signatures collected in the Toledo area by a real energetic woman. And they said, they're all invalid. And she says, why? She said, because your signature on these sheets at age 52 doesn't match your signature when you were 21. And then the usual thing, oh, sue us. You know, yeah, yeah, the election's coming up fast. We're really going to get judicial justice here. You were treated worse in 2004 than any presidential candidate in the history of the country Except it was even worse in 1940 for the Communist Party, Earl Browder, because they pulled the same kind of tricks on on him that they did on you, but even to a greater extent. (laughs) Well, you know, I was sued 23 times our campaign by Democratic (laughs) operatives in two dozen states in just 12 weeks in 2004. And uh, it was impossible to have enough lawyers to defend. I remember once we got a notice on Friday in Pennsylvania, one of the more notorious ballot excluding states, saying, appear in court, like 12 courts in Pennsylvania, to defend your petition signatures from the attack. Because in Pennsylvania, as you know, it's administered by the courts, not by a state election commission, the ballot access rules. Tell us about what's going on in terms of independent and third parties. In your newsletter, Ballot Access News, which we'll tell you, listeners, how you can get in a moment, you actually follow all kinds of major and minor party statuses on all the 50 states and where they're at, you know, whether they're on the ballot, who's on the ballot. Just from looking at one, it's really amazing the detail that you come up with. All kinds of parties people never heard of. The Silver Republican Party, the American Independent Party, the Green Party, the Workers' League. You go through history here to show how the American voters have been deprived of progressive agendas, more choices, more voices on the ballot. In contrast to the 19th century, before all these ballot access rules started becoming so terrible, where people who could get on the ballot just by printing the ballots before the Civil War, I understand. So tell us a little bit about the history here and where third parties set the agenda for the major parties finally to come to their senses and what the contributions have been by third parties. Well, before 1888, there was no such thing as a government printed ballot. People were free to prepare their own ballot take a piece of paper and write down who you want, and that's a ballot. But that was too much work for most people. So most people just got a ballot from their favorite party. The parties had to do a lot of work printing up ballots and distributing them. And if you didn't like all the names on your party ballot, you were perfectly free to scratch off candidates you didn't like and write in people you did like. So that's why when the government took over the job, at first – They were very careful to keep right in space on the ballot because people had always had the perfect right to vote for anybody they wanted. And they didn't want to take that away, at least right away. (laughs) But unfortunately, uh, we've lost that. In, In 1992, the U.S. Supreme Court said there's nothing in the Constitution that protects the voter's absolute right to vote for whoever he or she wants. And they upheld taking away right in space. And so now we've lost it in California. They've taken right in space off the ballot. They've confined, except for president, they've confined our general election ballot to just two names. Sometimes they're two Republicans, but more often it's two Democrats. So what we're seeing is people who actually go to the bother to vote, to cast a ballot, see two candidates and they don't like either one. So they leave their ballot blank. 
the polls are showing this year that 20 percent of the people who expect to vote are going to leave their ballot blank for certain offices. What kind of a system is it when people who want to vote can't vote for anyone they want? I know you didn't ask me about this specifically, but this is our chief setback. The top two system that California passed in 2010 is a terrible burden on the right of freedom for people to vote for whom they want. Listen to this, listeners. This is really atrocious. It's not just California. Well, it's two states. Washington also does it. It's just the two. Explain, now, Richard. We're talking to Richard Winger, editor of Ballot Access News. I hope this one is overturned on constitutional grounds. Just describe what's happening, how it's boomeranging against the two parties that proposed it in California. Well, you're right. <laughs> it's the Republican Party more than the Democratic Party that is responsible for the California and Washington top two system. It says everybody runs in the primary and only the top two people can run in November. So this year, as last election in California, we just have two Democrats in the ballot for U.S. Senate. So there's an extreme battle, of course, everybody knows this going on right now between the Democratic and Republican parties. It's fierce, intense. And yet in California, we have a U.S. House race where people cannot vote for a Democrat. And we have the U.S. Senate race where people cannot vote for a Republican because because they didn't make the top two voting. Right. It all depends on how many people from each party run in the primary. There's only three U.S. House seats in the entire country without a Democrat this year. The Democrats are really good this year about running candidates. One of them is in California. It's on the 8th district in the primary. Three Democrats ran and only two Republicans. So the three Democrats split up the Democratic vote, and the two Republicans came in first and second. So that really inhibits freedom so to vote wh- in the general So where is it in the courts now? It's being challenged. Well, we only have one case pending, and it's been pending forever. I mean, it's three years old, and we still don't even have a decision it's in the Ninth Circuit. We have a really good panel. Unfortunately, one of the three, after they had the oral argument, one of the three judges, Judge Reinhardt, died. That was very sad. So that delayed the case. They had to pick a new judge. And every day I think, will this decision come out today? Maybe it'll come out after the election. I have a hunch that the judges are being, they're being very slow. There's about a dozen ballot access cases pending and we just don't get the decision. I think everybody's so nervous about the upcoming election. I think they're slowing down their work, and maybe they'll, these decisions will come out after the election. Thank goodness it's only two weeks away. What is Richard Winger's ideal ballot access laws? Would you have well, the federal government have a uniform ballot access for federal candidates and not state candidates? What, what's your ideal? Absolutely. There's only two countries in the world where the national government doesn't write the rules for the national elections for getting on the ballot. That's the United States and Switzerland. There were three political scientists in Canada who wrote a, a very good reference book setting forth the ballot access laws of all the democratic countries in the world. And they said in their foreword, we're sorry, but we had to omit the United States and Switzerland because those are the only two countries where there there is no national law on how you get on the ballot for national office. And instead, every subunit of the country writes its well, own what, laws. What, whether for state elective offices or federal offices, what's your ideal law? Well, we had a bill introduced in Congress, nine sessions of Congress. It was okay. It said a petition requirement of one-tenth of one percent of the last vote cast. And so that's easy to understand and uniform. Congressman John Conyers introduced it, three sessions of Congress, and then Congressman Tim Penny from Minnesota introduced it, and then Ron Paul from Texas introduced it in four sessions. So that would have worked fine. You know, in Canada, it's 100 signatures and a filing fee of 1,000 Canadian dollars to get on the ballot to run for parliament. That's fair. And the typical ballot in Canada typically has five parties on the ballot. In England, it's only 10 signatures and 500 pounds filing fee. So 
it works fine. We have so many good examples all around the world that we could copy, but this country has an unfortunate habit of ignoring the good practices of other countries. Well, before we get to Steve and David's questions, give quickly some of the worst state ballot access obstructions like North Carolina and California. Well, (laughs) North Carolina isn't the monster it used to be. I'm very happy to say that this year the legislature eased the petitions. So now it's only 11,000 for a new party. So it's not the monster that it used to be. That's that's why we, we do have a lot of good news. Georgia used to be 50,000. Now it's only 7,500 for president. Maryland. And you have to get twice the number because they strike so many of the signatures. That's so true. That's you have true. to double the number. North Carolina was over 100,000. We could never get on the Georgia ballot. Oklahoma was very difficult. How do people get your uh, ballot access news? It's been going since 1985. So obviously back in 1985, it was a paper publication because <laughs> that's all there was. It's still a paper publication. It's only $16 a year for 12 issues. If you use PayPal, you can use PayPal to get it. But just go to the web page, which you've, and I'll say it again, you've mentioned it already, and that tells you how to subscribe, ballot-access.org, or nowadays, just Google Ballot Access News. You asked me what was the worst, and I yeah, I, worst. I didn't really answer you. <laughs> yeah. Right now, for president, I mentioned the Florida problem, and we're hoping to sue them very soon. I think the ACLU will do it. And then Texas is still a horror nightmare. And I think there's going to be a lawsuit filed against Texas also. Texas is the only state left where you can't sign the petition if you voted in the primary. So yeah, even if you get on the ballot, they got all kinds of shenanigans. Like I got on uh, the New York state ballot in 2008, and suddenly I got fewer votes than I got in Ohio, which is usually just the reverse. And I learned that they put my name figuratively around the corner of the ballot where most people couldn't see it. There's no end to their shenanigans. There's no criminal violation. It's like, oh, that's just politics, the two parties, you know. You're right. The New York ballot is just the epitome of irrationality. They used to use mechanical voting machines, so they had to design the ballot in a certain number of columns or a certain number of rows, depending on the type of mechanical voting machine. Well, guess what? Seven years ago, they got rid of the mechanical voting machines, but they still designed the paper ballot. It's a paper ballot now as though it were a mechanical voting machine and they only have nine rows or nine columns. And there are a lot of parties on in New York. So when there's a 10th party on, they squeeze the candidates of two parties into a single column. It's a problem this year. You should see it. I mean, I I filed a complaint to the secretary of state, never answered. No, it's a total tyranny here. The two parties do it to themselves too, in some ways to each other. David, uh, Steve, what kind of questions or comments do you have? This is fascinating. Richard Winger, the public citizen extraordinaire, right off his kitchen table, supports himself very, very modestly with subscriptions. What would you like to ask the world's expert on electoral ballot access in the United States? Is this country equipped to handle a viable third party? Well, a a permanent third party. We're just going to have to start paying attention to the rest of the world and looking at proportional representation and ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is finally in use in one state, Maine. And I'm hoping... You want to explain that, Richard? Okay. This system was invented over 100 years ago. Ranked choice voting enables voters to give the government more information about what they really want. With ranked choice voting, you don't just put an X next to the name of the candidate you like the best. You put a number one next to your favorite candidate, and you put a number two in the ballot next to your second favorite candidate, and a number three if you want to. You don't have to. So they, when they count the ballots, if, if somebody got 50% of the first choice ballots, that's fine. They're elected. But if nobody gets the majority from the number one ballots, then they drop out the weakest candidate and redistribute all the ballots of the people that voted for that 
weakest candidate as number one. And of course, this solves the so-called spoiler problem. I hate to say that word, but I think we all know what it means. If we had had ranked choice voting in 2000, it's quite obvious to me, and you may disagree, that's okay, that Al Gore would have won the election, not George W. Bush. And then even better is proportional representation. If anyone comes up with an objective list of the 10 best countries in the world, the the 10 countries where life is best, invariably, at least nine of them are countries that use proportional representation. Proportional representation is the dominant system in Europe. And surveys have shown that there's a greater fit between public policy and public opinion in the countries with proportional representation. Explain that to the listener. And by the way, just to point out, I think we should remember Gore did win the election and it was taken away from him. That's true. The You're Electoral right. College and You're shenanigans right. in Florida and the Supreme Court 5-4 decision. Well, I just want to underline something you just said. A year after the 2000 presidential election, the big wealthy news organizations put their resources together. They obtained all the Florida ballots. They recounted them. They took their time. They did it accurately. And they found that Gore got more popular votes than Bush. And this is very little known. I saved my New York Times edition that had that news. It didn't get a lot of attention because it was right after 9-11. Right. He made the news organization that did this. Was all, oh, all of them. They pulled their resources. I you see. know, the TV networks, the big New York Times, Washington Post. The reason they didn't discover this is poor Gore. He didn't know. None of us knew. There were 7,000 Florida voters who both X'd the box next to Gore's name and wrote him in. So the machine thought the voter had voted for two people and it was an invalid ballot. But Obviously, if somebody votes for Gore twice, that the intent of the voter is clear. That should have been counted for Gore. And he never got credit for those votes because, unfortunately, he only asked that the undervotes be counted. He didn't think to ask that the overvotes be counted. And now, OK, there were 3,000 people that wrote in George Bush and X the box for George Bush, too. But that was a 4,000 net gain for Gore, and that would have made all the difference. We never the, even knew it. Wasn't the mistake he made that he was only asking for recounts in the precincts he thought he did well, and he never that, asked for it? That's another count problem. He only asked for certain counties. He should have asked for the, all the counties. He was being but he, too even clever. if he had, since he only asked that the undervotes be recounted, he still wouldn't have made it. He needed to have asked that they all be looked at, including the overvotes. Yeah, and, um, and David, this count a year later was for the whole state. Right, but he didn't ask yeah. for that. He, he didn't no, ask he for did. that because yeah. he, he no, was trying clear. to be too he, smart. He, the Democrats and Gore bungled it. Just explain before we leave proportional representation. Proportional representation gives a party the same share of seats in the national legislative body that it won in the election. This is why the Green Party in Germany has been able to be so influential if it gets 15% of the votes, it gets 15% of the seats in the national parliament. So that's very satisfying to the voters because your vote is never wasted. You know, Every vote is counted. Something. Whereas yeah. if you vote with other voters and you get 49% of the vote and the other side gets 51, all 49% of the vote don't mean anything under the present U.S. system. Proportional representation basically gives every vote a meaning. Well, we have to close. Thank you very much, Richard Winger, public citizen extraordinaire, editor of the Ballot Access News, right out of his kitchen table in his California apartment. You can get Ballot Access News for $16 for one year every month. Make the check out to Ballot Access News and send it to Ballot Access News Box 470296, Box 470296, San Francisco, California, 94147. If you want to send it the old-fashioned way, otherwise you can send it to which email address, Richard? 
if you use PayPal, they do want you to put in a email, and, and so you put sub, S-U-B, at richardwinger.com. But you can go on the web page for Ballot Access News, and it's much easier to understand. Thank you Just very Google much. Thank Ballot you for your News. heroic civic work, Richard Winger. Thanks so much for having me. We have been speaking to Richard Winger, editor of Ballot Access News. We will link to Ballot Access News at ralphnaderradiohour.com. And uh, we have some time for some listener questions. I will take the first one. And this is from longtime listener Dale West, who says, with the Kavanaugh appointment to the Supreme Court confirmed, should attention now be given to who is going to fill Judge Kavanaugh's post at the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C.? And he says all of these lower court, federal court positions have less visibility, but they are just as important as the Supreme Court due to their jurist size. Why not generate more public awareness on these lower court nominations that are subject to Senate confirmation? Agreed, Dale. And no one's doing that more determined than Senator Mitch McConnell, who's ramming through, as we speak, one district judge nominee after another, and the Democrats can't stop him. And so he's going to move very fast to fill Brett Kavanaugh's post in the key U.S. Court of Appeals based in Washington, D.C., and he'll get it through because he's determined. And it looks like the Republicans are going to control the Senate. There used to be a filibuster, which required 60 or more votes, but Senator Reid, the Democratic leader at the time, a few years ago got rid of it to get his choice of justice through with the majority vote. And, of course, Mitch McConnell smacked his lips and said, when it's our turn, we're going to really show you how to get judges of our liking, often corporate judges, on the circuit courts as well as the Supreme Court. This next question comes from Joe Kavar. It involves unions and wages. He says, I currently live in Minneapolis, work full time as a deli lead in a co-op. He lives in the same neighborhood as his work. He writes, the co-op allegedly prides itself as a place that adjusts wages based on cost of living in the area. I'm a manager. I'm single, no kids, and I live in the neighborhood. For me to rent a one-bedroom apartment anywhere around here, it's about 50% of my monthly gross income. In order to get in the 25% range, I'm forced to have a roommate or rent a room instead of being able to support myself alone. It's maddening that my union seems like a charade. What should I do? Well, this is a classic example. The Minneapolis-St. Paul area has the greatest number of food co-ops in the country, and they're supposed to be run by the consumers, and the workers should be treated adequately And there's often a conflict. You want to raise prices to the consumers in the co-op that you consumers own in order to pay a better wage? Or do you want to keep wages more modest and keep prices better for the consumer? Given his figures, it looks like they're not paying very much. Can't imagine what the union is doing for that. But if you're only making as a manager of the deli, you're only making a wage where you have to spend 50% of your gross income for your rent, that doesn't speak well for the resolution of this tension between the co-op pro-consumer and the rights of workers in a co-op to have a living wage. So I don't know any more detail, Joe, uh, about your union, but your figures illustrate something needs to be done here. Thank you for that question. Our next question comes from... Bill Ferrari, and he's very upset about a subject we've talked about, tax subsidies for corporations who move their businesses abroad. And essentially, he wants to know how to fix this. And he doesn't expect that either major party will touch it because it's their baby, he says. How do you fix that, Ralph? Well, one thing is you tax a U.S. corporation who makes profits by selling U.S. products in other countries as if they sold products in the U.S. The money is produced by the U.S. corporation. Instead, now they can park their money overseas, and as long as they don't repatriate all those profits, which are in the trillions of dollars collectively, they don't have to pay any federal tax. And so that's where the corporate lobbies have secured these huge 
tax overseas escapes, which are accentuated by being placed in tax havens like Luxembourg, Ireland, the island of Cork, the Grand Cayman Islands, and the Caribbean and elsewhere. If you look up James Henry, he is a tax expert that deals with these issues. You should get more information on his website, James Henry. And we've had James Henry on the show. So if you go to our website and put him in the search box, you can listen to his take on that. I think we had him on the show maybe a year, year and a half ago. Yes, Thank indeed. you for the and question. We had him a few days ago at our full day conference titled, quote, Destroying the Myths of Market Fundamentalism, end quote. Uh, tremendous speakers, thinkers, doers, people who know what they're talking about. And Jim Henry was one of the presenters on the stage in Washington, D.C. So if you go to Real News Network, you can see the whole proceedings. And C-SPAN was there. C-SPAN 3 covered all eight hours, destroying the myths of market fundamentalism. Well, thank you for your questions. Keep them coming on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. I want to thank our guests again today, Congressman Jamie Raskin from the 8th District of Maryland. We will link to his 20 points that rebut the GFP agenda. And also Ballot Access News' Richard Winger. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. A transcript of this show will eventually appear. Actually, we're doing pretty well. It usually comes out on the Monday after. It'll appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. For Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. And Ralph has got two new books out, The Fable, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. To acquire a copy of that, go to ratsreformcongress.org. And the other one, To the Ramparts, How Bush and Obama Paved the Way for the Trump Presidency and How It's Not Too Late to Change Course. We will link to that also on our webpage. Join us next week when our guest will be Anand Giridharadas, author of Winners Take All, and Andrew Keen, author of How to Fix the Future. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Jimmy, Steve, David. Thank you, listeners. Get your friends, neighbors, and coworkers out to vote if they show any reluctance from exercising their democratic franchise. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Welcome to the wrap-up. First, Steve, David, and Ralph have an important discussion about the myth of market fundamentalism. Speaking of the myths of market fundamentalism, Ralph, I was watching, I believe, MSNBC yesterday, and Ali Velshi had on the Trump's head of the Economic Advisory Committee, and they just put out a report about uh, socialism. And this seems to be the real talking point of the Republicans is labeling Democrats as socialists or wanting socialism and that they want to turn this country into Venezuela. And Velshi asked him about health care. And this, I forget his name, the head of the economic advisors talked about how the market system is great for innovation in the healthcare industry because all those countries who have all this coverage that he's talking about he says, where does the innovation come from? And he wasn't really challenged on that. How would you challenge that? Well, the U.S. healthcare system is innovative. They've managed to make huge profits by refusing to cover tens of millions of patients. That's pretty innovative. I don't know any other Western country that does that. <laughs> so the healthcare corporate system in the U.S. is very innovative, and they've got the taxpayer on the hook to fund tens of billions of dollars over the decades that developed the innovative drugs that were given free to selected drug companies without any royalties back to the taxpayer from the profits and without any reasonable price provisions. They're pretty innovative. The medical device industry is a gouging industry. They've developed a lot of new technologies. But what they don't tell us is a lot of this is government-funded research and development. It's not the companies themselves so much as it is the flow of your taxpayer dollars. And we can go on and on exposing this. And this is what I mean by the myths of market fundamentalism. These corporations do everything possible to avoid free market 
accountability by getting the government to subsidize them, to bail them out, to provide secure markets and patent monopoly protections that are extended often indefinitely. But is there any truth to what he says about private industry being innovative and that we would lose that if we had a national health care Medicare for all system? Not at all, because it would continue the National Institutes of Health subsidies and other departmental subsidies to pay for the research and development that the private industry claims credit for. They don't tell you in their ads that these anti-cancer drugs were heavily subsidized for research and development and clinical tests by you, the taxpayer. They try to give you the impression that it's their own private investment. They spend far more money advertising and marketing than they do in R&D. They rely on Uncle Sam to do a lot of that. That means you, the taxpayer. And it infuriates me because, of course, we've talked a lot about this kind of thing on the show, but infuriates me when in this mainstream media, those arguments aren't brought up to rebut that. These these uh, yeah, the uh, journalists Party and pundits seem not to do, be aware of this. Yeah, the Democratic Party doesn't do a good job of rebuttal. The one thing we lead in Western countries over the decades is we have spent hundreds of billions of tax dollars for R&D for health care for medical devices, for a lot of the things that the private corporations take credit for. And in other Western countries, they simply did not spend that kind of money. That's why we have more creativity. It's the fact that it's publicly funded, and the corporations made full advantage of that. They didn't want to risk their own capital. Right. And, and, it's and how many have 15 erectile dysfunction drugs and nothing for hepatitis? That's another thing. They have been creative, the private drug industry, with what's called lifestyle drugs, ignoring vaccines, ignoring a lot of serious ailment drug treatments, which they rely more on the National Institutes of Health. They like the lifestyle drugs because they're taken regularly. They don't like vaccines because you don't take them every day. Right. The drug companies are not just American. The, the Bayer is German. Novartis is Swiss. Genentech is owned by Switzerland. I mean, it's not like America has the monopoly on innovation when it comes to coming up with all these great drugs. That's right. And these drug companies charge American consumers the highest prices in the world, even though they are coddled, but with tax credits, with free National Institutes of Health research with all kinds of subsidies, and they allow these drug companies to export their production to China and India. We had a program on that recently by the author of China Rx, and these drugs are not adequately supervised in China and India by the Food and Drug Administration, and they're shipped back here, and there have been a lot of problems, deaths, contaminated drugs, etc. So the drug companies have redefined corporate greed. It's limitless. And it just infuriates me when I see this specter of socialism being brought up and nobody rebuts it with the idea that, no, we do already live in a socialist country. It's corporate socialism. It's socialism for the well-off. And That's if right. That and that's point the way made, to argue it. The minute you argue that way, Steve, they backtrack because they can't handle it. They know that they are relying on government freebies. They're freeloading on the taxpayer. I mean, the argument seems so easy to make. And, and last week when we were talking to Michael Lighty about Medicare for All, and he broke down the idea that, yes, there will be taxes raised to pay for Medicare for All, but you won't pay co-pays and premiums. And when they did the study of that, it was determined that somebody with an average salary would get a 9% raise. They'd be making money. So you get health care and a raise. It's never couched that way. They're always on the defensive about it. That's right. Well, because it's not that they don't know the argument, Steve, is that they're compromised. They're dialing for these commercial campaign dollars that make them wishy-washy. Yeah. Now, Steve asks another question of Richard Winger, editor of Ballot Access News. Mr. Winger, I wanted to ask you, I know you, you watch dog party access to ballots, do you also watch, Doug, because the big news today is voter suppression, individual ballot access impediments? Yes, I do cover that. 
but not as in as much detail because there's other media that covers that also. You're doing I, candidate suppression. Well, voters are mistreated. You just mentioned that. I mean, Georgia's the getting all the publicity this week. <laughs> George is defending itself against five lawsuits over the way they treat voters, whether the signature on the application for an absentee ballot matches, in the opinion of the clerk, the signature on the voter registration form, whether the ballot itself, when it comes in if in the mail, if, if they think the signature on the outer envelope doesn't match the voter registration signature. And then we have This other problem where Georgia Secretary of State stopped processing new voter registration applications if there was the tiniest discrepancy between the information on the voter registration application and and records of that person that the state government already had, such as a missing hyphen or a missing middle initial. There's a lot of publicity about this, fortunately. I'm sure you're up on it if you're reading the newspapers. I, I do cover that, but not in, not in as much detail because there's other media that covers it. And that's a wrap. Join us again next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting right